Now, I struggled in school. I was the kid who uh, spent most of the day chilling out with the janitor in the hallway, right? I was the kid in middle school who had such a hard time keeping his mouth shut that I grew up on a first name basis with Shirley the receptionist in the principal's office. And I was a kid in high school who had such a hard time learning to read that I spent most of my high school days hiding in the bathroom to escape reading out loud with tears streaming down my face. I was diagnosed with dyslexia or a language-based learning disability in fourth grade. I was diagnosed with ADD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in fifth grade. And I dropped out of school for a year in sixth grade. I was a kid who believed that because I was different, I was deficient. That I was the stupid, crazy, and lazy kid. And you can imagine by the time I re-enrolled in high school, there were a lot of low expectations that surrounded me. I was told by my dad that I would probably be a high school dropout. And I was told by a teacher, unfortunately, that I would most likely end up in jail or incarcerated. But you know what? I beat those odds, you know, transcended those low expectations. I want to spend my time with you talking about what are the things, investments, commitments that help young folks like me beat those low expectations and prove them wrong. You know, and in my life, it was really three things. I'm here today because of multiple teachers, but I want to tell you about one of them. A guy named Father Young. Met Father Young at a tipping point in my life where I could have went left, but I went right. You know, first college before Brown, Iowa Marymount University. Went there on soccer scholarship, thought I was a dumb jock. Couldn't be anything but that. And on the first day on campus, the soccer coach made us go around to the different departments and listen to the presentations. And I went around and I didn't listen to anything until I got to the English department and the chair of the department, Father Young, was up there talking about literature and learning like his head was on fire. And I was moved. So I went up to him afterwards and I said, Father Young, you, you moved me. I think I might want to be an English major here at LMU, but I don't know if I can do it. I don't read well, I don't write well, I don't spell well. And the guy looked right at me and said, I believe in you. Some of the most gifted thinkers in the world, WBH, John Irving, they were thinkers like you. You can do this. So I was changed. That moment, I walked across campus to the other side, to the Dean of Academic Enrollment. I walked into that guy's office, and I said, I'm going to study me some English literature here at LMU, right? <laughs> it, it, it is game time. Let's do this, you know? And that guy, he pulled out my file, right? The Individualized Education Plan, the IEP, right? NSA, KGB, got nothing on the IEP, okay? <laughs> They've been doing deep intel on me my whole life. It ain't good news in that file. <laughs> it's this thick. He flips through it. He laughs and he says, English literature, I won't approve that major. You should consider something less intellectual. So I was deflated like a balloon, back to the kid in the hallway, walked back across campus to Father Young and said, not going to be an English major. And he said, why? I said, that guy thinks it's too hard because of my disabilities. Father Young was real quiet. Then he looked at me and he said in a way that only an old school Jesuit can, he said, well, son, I guess you're just going to have to prove that bastard wrong. <laughs> And, and the next day I enrolled in four English literature classes and that guy who told me I should consider something less intellectual, let's just say that he has an autographed copy of both of my books on his desk right now, right? <laughs> I was a kid who believed that because I was different, I was deficient. That I was the stupid, crazy, and lazy kid. But I've come to believe to my core that these things that we have labeled to be deficiencies or disorders aren't that, they are differences in the truest sense of the word. And the thing that really disables individuals is the way that those differences are treated by others. A foundation of my journey of change was a deep commitment to not just fixing kids' problems, but finding and celebrating and scaling their strengths. And if you listen to any journey of change by somebody like me who grew up in the hallway, it's all about finding that thing that they are good at. I want to spend my time celebrating the potential of those kids who learn and live differently.
Every single human being has a strength, talent, or interest that you can find and you can build a life on. Find your strengths and compensate for your weaknesses. What happened to you? Can you imagine how long ago I got tired of answering that question? But the fact of the matter is, my physical form, my story, is indeed part of the very powerful message that I believe surrounds attitude. I was on a, on a plane going to Vegas a couple of weeks ago, and a lady was sitting beside me on the plane. The plane took off. She seemed to be uncomfortable. That's not uncommon. All she did was look at me and go, one word, thalidomide. Thalidomide was never meant to be given to pregnant women. In fact, it was a sedative, and it was supposed to be so safe, they thought that anybody could take it. Now, the drug was banned in 1963, thank God, because it by then had only deformed over 20,000 babies. It could have been hundreds of thousands had the drug continued to live on. Now, it's interesting because this is what she went on to say. I didn't take those pills. Something told me to throw them in the garbage, and I am so glad I did because I was blessed with healthy, normal babies. The point is, thalidomide was a terrible, terrible thing but that's not how I see it in my own personal life. My life started in a very unorthodox fashion. There is no question that being born without arms is not something people would wish for, right? They called us the victims. I disagree. August 23rd, 1985 was the first time in my life I ever considered how my own mother and father must have felt the first time they held me. And then it occurred to me an even more powerful thought. My mom was 55 years old the first time she held me, and my dad was 53, and I was an orphan in Yorkton, Saskatchewan, because my birth family were consulted and counseled and advised to simply sign papers and give me up. Because in 1960, babies born with severe handicaps had no life. So on the fourth day of my life, I was homeless. Enter my life, the changers. Hilda Law, Jack Law. So Hilda was my primary caregiver. Hilda had an attitude that is very difficult for me to describe. She saw something that nobody else saw. And that was, yes, indeed, a positive potential. They loved me, they took me home, they were charitable, they were very, very powerful in their faith, but not one time did I view them as nice, okay? I had to make my bed every morning before school. I had to pick up my toys every night before bed. I had to vacuum the carpet three times a week because mother expected neatness. Wondering every day, do you really love me? I knew that I would not easily climb Mount Everest. I knew there were certain things that were impossible for me. And then one day I found a piano. And that was huge. I'm looking at my feet, I'm watching the piano, I'm thinking, I'm gonna suck at this too. That's how I felt. But mom heard me play, and she came racing down to the basement. And, and, and she said, was that you? I gave the standard 10-year-old answer. Do you see anybody else down here? And then she made me play it again. And, and, and then she stood behind the piano crying. I would ask my mother, in fact, quite frankly, it was the week she met my son. Why did you cry behind the piano that day? She said, you don't really understand, do you? What? How hard it was to be with you every day, to see the looks, to see the stares, to hear the insults. But more than anything, the hardest part, Alvin, was to push you beyond belief. It was within every illogical thought in my brain to not do that to you, to not force you, to not challenge you, to not take you to extremes that people thought I was cruel with you. Do you have any idea what that felt like? That's why I cry. Hello, Mrs. Law. My name is Blaine McClary. I'm the band director for the Yorkton City Band Program. Do you have a son named Alvin? We do. Does Alvin have a talent for music that you're aware of? Do you think he'd like to be in the band? Well, Mr. McClary, probably a good time to tell you that <laughs> Alvin sort of has no arms. Hello? But when I walked in the house and saw my mom smiling in 1971, I'll never forget that smile. I'll never forget that day. She had a great smile, ugly teeth, great smile. She goes, honey, I got news for you. You're gonna be in the band. <gasps> what band? School band. Well, how'd that happen? I don't know, we're gonna go to the school and find out right now, get in the car, we're going to the school. On the way to the school, she told me about the first phone call that happened six weeks earlier. She didn't tell me about it, because the guy hung up. Didn't wanna hurt my feelings. 
And then she said, but he called back this morning. He says he's got an instrument for you to play. A trombone. A trombone, for God's sake. And like a game show host, he went, what do you think? I was 11. What do you think I thought? It was the stupidest looking thing I'd ever seen in my entire life. Well, can you move the slide with your foot? Yeah, I can do that. Well, I can do that. That's cool. Can you make this noise? <laughs> okay, good. Can, can you do it in the mouthpiece and move the slide? Yeah. <laughs> well, this noise came out. <gasps> 11 year olds love noise, don't they? But I particularly was affected. I love that sound. Just a feeling. That day changed the pathway of my life. What really changed my world? Was it the trombone? Not exactly. The girls didn't want to date me because they couldn't quite grasp holding on to this. That's what makes my wife Darlene that much more special. She doesn't see the outside. She sees the human. And there is a difference. My life in music is what changed it all. Music taught me that life does not change in one day, in one week, in one year. It takes steps after step after step after step after step. All right, you can clap for that if you'd like. Why did I just do that? To show off? Yeah. To impress you? Yeah. I want to impress you. Because of my ego? No. No, see, that, that was the most important thing that I learned in my professional life. In my opinion, and it is my opinion, you earn joy. It is not a human right. You attain success. I got a label, it's fixed right on my forehead. And it used to bug me until it occurred to me, I just have to change what the label says. That's all I gotta do. It's not gonna be easy because I'm asking society an awful lot to see the human inside the disability. But the fact is, it took me a long time to come to that conclusion. They've all got labels. Let's just change the label. Let's change the label from victim to victor. Let's change the label to one that says, I am, I am who I am. Does identified as mentally retarded, put back from the fifth grade into the fourth grade, and stayed in that category until I got out of high school. I don't have any college training. But I met a high school teacher who one day changed my life. I was waiting on another student, and when he came in, he said to me, young man, go to the board and write what I'm about to tell you. And I said, I, I can't do that, sir. He said, why not? I said, I'm not one of your students. He said, it doesn't matter. Follow my directions now. I said, I can't do that, sir. He said, why not? I said, because I'm educable, mentally retarded. And he came from behind his desk, and he looked at me. He said, don't ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. And as he talked, my heart began to beat fast. Tears began to run by my eyes, and, and I was in the back just listening to him because the speech he was giving, that speech was for me. And he said, Les Brown, he said, if you want to do anything worthwhile in life, you've got to be hungry. I told Mr. Washington I wanted to become a disc jockey. And so I started working to develop myself. He said, I want you to practice every day being a disc jockey. I said, but I don't have any job now. He said, it doesn't matter. He said that it's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. And as I was working to develop myself, I applied for a job as a disc jockey, WMB on Miami Beach. I went to a guy named Milton Butterball. I said, how you doing, Mr. Butterball? I'd like to get a job as a disc jockey. He looked at me, he said, you have any broadcast background? I said, no, sir, I don't. You have any journalism background? I said, no, sir, I don't. He said, we don't have any jobs available. I said, yes, sir. I went back to Mr. Washington and I told him, he said, don't take it personally. He said, most people are so negative, they will have to say no seven times before they say yes. He said, go back again. So I went back again. I said, how you doing, Mr. Butterball? My name is Les Brown. He said, I know what your name is. What do you want? I said, I'd like to know whether or not you have any jobs at this jockey, sir. He said, didn't I just tell you yesterday we didn't have any jobs? I said, yes, sir, but I know whether or not somebody got laid off or somebody was fired, sir. He said, no one was laid off or fired. Now get on out of here. 
I came back the next day like I was seeing you for the first time. I said, hello, Mr. Butterball, how are you? He looked at me with rage. He said, go get me some coffee. I said, yes, sir. And I went to get him some coffee. After a while, I would get their lunch and dinner, and I would go in the control rooms and take the disc jockeys their food, and I would not leave until they would ask me to leave. One Saturday afternoon, while I was at the radio station, a guy named Rock was drinking while he was on the air. I was the only one there, looking at him through the control room windows, walking back and forth, young, ready, and hungry. Pretty soon the phone rang and it was the general manager. And I answered the phone, I said, hello. He said, Les, this is Mr. Klein. I said, I know. He said, Rock can't finish his program. I said, I know. He said, would you call one of the other DJs in? I said, yes, sir. I hung the phone up. I said, now he must be think I'm crazy. I called my mom and my girlfriend, Cassandra. I said, y'all turn up the radio and come out on the front porch. I'm about to come on the air. I waited for about 20 minutes and I called him back. I said, Mr. Klein, I can't find nobody. He said, young boy, do you know how to work the controls? I said, yes, sir. He said, go in there and don't say nothing here. I said, yes, sir. I couldn't wait to get behind those controls. I put on an old Stevie Wonder record called Fingertips. I sat down behind that turntable. I said, look out, this is me, LB, Triple P. Les Brown, your platter playing papa. There were none before me, and there will be none after me. Therefore, that makes me the one and only. Young and single and love to mingle, certified, bona fide, and dubbly qualified to bring you satisfaction, a whole lot of action. Look out, baby, I'm your love man. I was hungry. I was hungry. You got to be hungry. Begin to know that you have greatness within you. And if just one of you here begin to envision yourselves as being blessed and highly favored to reach your goals, if just one of you capture the essence of what that means, that you have greatness within you and a responsibility to manifest that greatness, that you can make your parents proud, you can make your school proud, you can touch millions of people's lives and the world will never be the same again because you came this way. It was hard, ladies and gentlemen, coming to speak to people. And I was facing financial difficulties in my own life. I was behind on my bills and my dreams and I'm saying to them, you can live your dream. It was hard, ladies and gentlemen. It was very difficult to pick myself up each day believing that I could do it. There were times that I doubted myself. I used to ask myself, can I do this? And something said within me, you're the one. Don't give up on your dream. By continuing to push forward, by continuing to run toward my dream, that one day I would have my own talk show. It's a long shot, ladies and gentlemen, from Liberty City, an abandoned building on a floor never knowing my mother or father. It's a long shot being here with you today in this dome in Atlanta. It's a long shot. No college training, labeled, educable, mentally retarded, but I kept running toward my dream. Don't stop. Don't stop running toward your dream. That was the door. I was buying, just lining up for lunch. They grabbed me out, dragged me all the way to here. Like just two, three guys, big guys, dragged me all the way here and they beat the shit out of me, right at this spot. And that happened multiple times, multiple times. I didn't tell my mom about it, but actually I had nightmares. I would wake up in the morning sweating, um, this fear, this panic, because then it's so unpredictable. You don't know when you go to school, when and where you're going to get attacked. At the time, my mom bought me one of the, these uh, English electronic dictionary. They were very expensive. It was like a few hundred dollars US, money that we didn't have. My mom sacrificed so much for me, so much as she decided to, to immigrate to Canada so that I have a better environment to learn my English, to have a better future for myself. 
in, in class because I couldn't understand what the teacher was saying. I would bring this dictionary out and I'll open it up. It's got a little pen and I would write on it and it would check what the teacher was saying. I was reading the book. I didn't understand what she was saying. And the kids, they were just trashing me. They were like, what is this, some fancy computer, you Asian kid? What do you think you bring this stuff, electronics thing, you're so who? And then I was like, I'm sorry, I didn't, I, I didn't, first I didn't understand what they're saying. I said, I don't, I don't, I don't, that's not what I meant. It's just what my mom bought for me. And then, and then they grab it and they were running around with it. I was trying to chase it to get it back because I didn't want anything to happen to that electronic dictionary. The damn kid took the dictionary. The window was open. He threw it out the window and landed on the pavement and broke the damn thing. I didn't let that stop me though. I was acting like the dictionary worked, but I actually had one of those old paper dictionary. And I was memorizing five to 10 words every day. Every day I'm learning because I didn't want my mom to find out that, that the, the dictionary didn't work. And the best way to, to hide that incident is actually by improving my English. So I had one of those big dictionary. I mean, I, it's all dog year. I mean, I flip through it, highlight it, write down and memorize each word. I will pronunciate, pronunciate, pronunciate. I will read through it. I will read it a hundred times just to get one word right. I think every incident, even this, you can see I, I feel, I'm a little bit, even thinking about it, a little bit angry at it, but it shaped who I am today. And it trains me not to make excuse. It's whatever I, c I can use it, whatever I can make out of it. There's some good that could come out with that. From that kid to who I am today, from the kid who couldn't speak a word of English, who didn't have the electronic dictionary, to now writing dozen books and impacting millions of people. But it started here. There's no excuse. It doesn't matter where you came from, it doesn't matter the roads you've been down, it doesn't matter your background, it doesn't matter your race, it doesn't matter. You could do it. My grandmother became my first hero. Growing up, my grandmother never used an alarm clock. But every morning, my grandmother would wake up at 4.15. And at 4.16, her feet would hit the floor, usually right in front of my face. And that's what would wake me up. But I would lay there and I would pretend like I was still asleep because me and 4.15 really didn't get along. But grandma would look at the back of my head, I could feel her staring at me and then finally she would say, now sugar, grandmama know you ain't sleep. You just supposed to go on and get on up and get ready for school. And my grandmother was known for saying things that would kind of make you a little angry because they made so much sense and you couldn't argue with her. <laughs> parents, you know, there are things that you, when you become parents, you start to say to your own kids. Like my grandmother would say, now son, you knew when you laid down there last night that you had to get up this morning. <laughs> I don't know why every single morning you lay there and act surprised. You ought to be thankful that the Lord saw fit to wake you up this in your right mind. <laughs> But what my grandmother was encouraging me to do was simply to be grateful for the opportunity. In spite of all that I had been through in my life, she just wanted to make sure that I understood the opportunity that I'd been given. My life got started, it was a little rough, it was a little rough start. I was born two months premature. My mother was walking up a flight of stairs and she didn't know this at the time, but a woman she had had an argument with earlier was standing above her holding a pot of boiling water. As my mom made her way up those stairs, that woman dumped that water onto my mom and sent her tumbling down the stairs and into premature labor. She received third degree burns to over 25% of her body. And when we were finally allowed to leave the hospital, as you can imagine, my mom was in a great deal of pain. Those burns just nearly, barely missed her face and covered most of the front of her body. So when we got home, she began taking a heavy sedative, pain medication to help her recover. When she took that medication, it was very difficult for her to watch me, so I would bounce around a lot. I'd stay with my mom for a little bit, and then I'd go stay with grandma, and I'd stay with some neighbors, aunties, and then back to my mother's house. I did that for the first three years of my life. When I was three years old, I was back at my mom's house, and I got into her purse, I found that medication, I swallowed everything in the bottle. When they found me, they rushed me to the hospital, and my heart would stop, and eventually I went into a coma. But because of that accident, because of that incident, the state of California, they did an investigation. And 
the conclusion that they came to was that it wasn't an accident. They removed me from my mother's home, I was made a ward of, the, ward of the state, and eventually I went into the foster care system. Shortly after I arrived to one of my foster homes, my foster mom, her name was Miss Alexander. Miss Alexander began locking me inside the closet with a light. She'd open the closet door, she'd kick me, hit me with a stick or a strap or whatever she, could, whatever she had. It was while I was in that foster home that I was sexually abused for the first time in my life. And oftentimes people will ask, you know, if that has to be the worst thing that could happen to someone. I have scars on my body that you can't see. I have a burn here in my hand that she put there with an iron. But all of that pain went away. The worst thing that Mrs. Alexander would do is she would open the closet door, she would stand over me, and she would say, you're stupid and you ain't gonna ever amount to nothing. And that hurt me more than any of the physical kicks or the physical pain because I believed it for a long time. I believed that, that I would never amount to anything, just like she said. Now, I didn't know this at the time, I found out a little bit later, but my grandmother, my hero, she had started going back and forth to court, trying to prove that she could take care of an active, handsome little boy. <laughs> and eventually the state of California, they granted her full custody of me. And I'll never forget, I was, I'll never forget standing on Miss Alexander's front porch waiting. She had my little belongings, everything that, that I had. I remember standing there, it may have only been a half an hour, but it felt like an eternity. And I can remember thinking, maybe no one's coming. But after a while, at the end of the block, I see the ugliest car I've ever seen in my life. And the car pulls up right in front of the porch. <laughs> and I remember all I could see are these two big glasses, bifocals. And I found out later that grandma had glaucoma. She wasn't even supposed to be driving. <laughs> but she gets out of that big car and she's got on this white floppy hat with this, it was a flower right there in the middle. And I remember she had on this long white dress that came all the way down to her ankles. And I found out later that, you know, that was grandma's Sunday best. It was an outfit that she only reserved for special occasions. And I can remember for once in my life feeling like I was some special occasion. I remember jumping into grandma's arms and squeezing her, and I remember her whispering and saying to me, everything's okay, you're a family. And everything was okay, just like grandmother said. And I had a lot to look forward to. I found out that my mom was going to court trying to prove that she could take care of me. And I can remember sitting there with my mother, and we, we'd talk, and we had a lot of different conversations. One thing I can remember saying, Mama, you know, one day when I get big, I'm going to buy you a nice house with a fireplace. I said, Mama, one day I'm going to... I'm gonna buy you a nice car. Not like grandmama, so get you a nice one. <laughs> but the truth is, I just really wanted to become a family again. And that's what I looked forward to. When I was 12 years old, I was asleep on my grandmother's floor. It was about four o'clock in the morning. We get a knock on the door. And it was my mom's roommate. Miss Howe, Miss Howe, come quick. Miss Howe was my grandma. She said, come quick, it's, it's Ruth. Ruth was my mom. She said, I can't wake her up. I think she's dead. And I can remember laying on that floor, you know, kind of wishing it was, thinking, hoping that it was maybe a dream. But it wasn't. And that's how I found out that all the hopes and dreams and things that I had to look forward to weren't going to happen. I became very angry. I became confused. I was hurt. I didn't really understand what was happening. I started acting out, hanging out with wrong people, breaking into houses, started stealing cars. I can remember not really caring what happened to me. I continued that behavior until I was 19. When I was 19, I was found myself standing in front of a judge. I was handcuffed, had a chain around my waist, and my handcuffs were attached to that chain. The judge looked at me and says, the state of California sentences you to 15 years in prison for armed robbery and assault with a deadly weapon. That day, when that door closed behind me for the first time as a convicted felon, I remember standing in that empty cell I remember my knees started to get weak and they started to shake uncontrollably. I ended up, I collapsed and I fell to the floor and I just started crying alone. And I can remember hearing voices. I heard the voice of my foster mom saying, you're stupid, you ain't gonna ever amount to nothing. I heard the voice of family members and friends of family that said, that boy's gonna end up just like his father. My father was a career criminal, he died in prison. I can remember laying there thinking to myself that this is where I'm gonna die. But here's what happened that would change my life. 
Shortly after I arrived to that prison, there was an educator there. His name was Charles Lyles, six foot three, ex-Marine. And I don't know what it was about me, but every time he saw me, he'd say, hey, Mr. Humphrey. And he had this big smile on his face, a smile that my kids would say, that's creepy. <laughs> but he smiled and he said, hey, Mr. Humphrey, how are you doing? He always called me Mr. Humphrey. He gave me that respect. He walked into my cell. He looked at me and he said, Mr. Humphrey, he says, prison doesn't have to be your life. He says, you can get out of here and you can do great things. He started to walk away and before he walked out of my cell, he turned around one last time and he says, Mr. Humphrey. I said, yes, sir. He says, I believe in you. And he walked out of my cell. And if he had continued to stand there, he would have seen the tears running down my face because no one had ever said that to me. But I remember thinking to myself, I'm going to make some changes and I'm going to change my life. And a little over four years after the day I originally collapsed and fell to the floor, I walked out of that prison on parole. That was over 18 years ago. I've never been back other than to mentor and help other people. But here's what I know. I know that when you've had a rough life, when you feel unwanted, I know that when you have hopes and dreams and when you have things that you can look forward to and when you have people in place that support you and push you, I know that that gives you a reason to live. It is a great day to be alive. And that's something that I haven't always said, but now it's something that I say to myself every single day at some point. If I'm having a great day or a bad day, that's something that I say. But what I also understand is that what my grandmother was thanking her higher power for each and every day was for the opportunity that she'd been given. And she never missed an opportunity to tell anyone that would listen, especially me, it's a great day to be alive.